Lord, we're determined to shout to the north, proclaim it in the south and the east and the west. There is a hero born of a woman, our hero. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that You would crush the head of that serpent. We pray that You would drive him back. Lord, the birds, they come to pluck up the seed. We pray, Lord, you, Your hand can shoo them away. Lord, we pray that the seed would plant, would take root, would grow. We pray that You going forth conquering and to conquer, riding upon a white horse to victory, we pray that You would subdue Your enemies. We pray that, Lord, those that are bent against You might be broken into surrender. We pray, Father, that, that You would give us souls. We pray that You'd be merciful. We pray, oh Lord, we pray for the power of God to be unleashed. power of resurrection. The power of the cross. We pray that our, our Savior, our hero, would indeed go forth subduing His enemies as a footstool under His feet. Lord, we pray, arise. Arise in this generation, in this place. Get glory to Your name, the city of San Antonio. Lord, show Your conquering power. Show Your gracious power. Show Your sin-killing power. Show the power of the cross. Show how You can take away from the strong man those who He believes He has in His power. Little puppets of the devil who He carries about to do His bidding, His will, slaves of sin. Lord, show Your power and how able You are to set men and women free. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. Well, let's start reading in verse 19. Hebrews 10.19 Some verses that we've been looking at, but just to throw some context upon, uh, primarily I want to look at verses 23, 24, 25 this morning, but we'll pick up reading verse 19. Therefore, brothers, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus... He starts this by confidence. We have confidence by the blood of Christ, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God. Since these things are true, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And here's where I want to look primarily. Based on those things, we should draw near. But also based on those things, those realities. The person and work of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, let us hold fast. The confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So let's try to get a picture of this in our minds. And What I want you to picture is verses 23, 24, 25. We've already dealt with drawing near. But get, get a picture of this. Look at verse 25. How does it start? Not neglecting to meet together. Now, now, that's putting it in the negative, right? He's telling us what He does not want us to do, which the inverse is actually what He wants us to do, which is to meet together. So, I mean, you picture this in your mind. He sees us meeting. I mean, that's... That, you all see that, right? The author sees people meeting together. What kind of people? Verse 24, let us. Let us. Well, who's the us? Go back up to verse 19. Brothers, sisters, that, that is inclusive. 
That is not gender specific there. That is inclusive of all the brethren. Brothers and sisters, that's the us. The picture is one of God's people in different places, different times. I mean, all the the way through this last 2,000 years, coming together. This is the local church meeting. And look at there at the end of verse 25. This is to keep happening until we arrive at the day. Isn't that interesting? The day. All the more as you see the day. I know the New King James and the ESV, they capitalize day. Like it's a day above other days. It's the day. Not just a special day of the week. This is a special day of all time. You know, can I tell you something? Any of you have any struggles with eschatology, like how things end? Do a study of the day. A lot of people get hung up on Revelation chapter 20 and they get all hung up on on some things that are said there rather than looking at some of the basic teaching of Scripture. The day. There is a day. And if you just go through the New Testament and study everything that is true of that day, I think it will help you enormously to come to grips with what the end looks like. I mean, basically, basically as you go through Scripture, Second Peter, you have the day of the Lord. It comes like a thief. In other words, not when anybody expect. The heavens will pass away with a roar. In other words, the day, the day, all this is gone. It's all burned up. It all goes away. When this day comes, we will keep meeting together until that day, or even all the more as we see that day approaching. Second Peter 3.12, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. It's called the day of the Lord. It's called the day of God. 1 Corinthians 3.13, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. In other words, the day is not only when everything gets burned up. It's the day of God. It's the day of the Lord. It's the day when all of our works will be tested. It's the day when the Lord comes. In John 6.40, I will raise Him up on the last day. Here's the day. It's the last day. It's the day of judgment. It's the day when all this passes away. It's the day when all of our works are going to be disclosed. And the thing is, we are to keep meeting together until that day. By the way, in that day when He comes, if you look at the parable of the virgins, He doesn't zap away the five good virgins in a rapture. He comes and He takes the five that are ready And he closes the door and the five that aren't ready don't now have a thousand years to get right. It's over, folks. It's over. When the day comes, it's over. Your works are put on the table. This world is burned up. It is the day of God. It is the day of the Lord. It is the day. It's also called in Scripture the day of eternity. 2 Peter 3.18 It's the eternal day. Ephesians 4.30, the day of redemption. Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And he gets these kind of realities in Scripture about this day. And so, notice verse 23. Our author sees brethren meeting together who fit the description of verse 23. What are these people? These people are unwaveringly confident, right? Confident. They have, a, they have a confession of faith. That doesn't mean that they just belong to a church that has a doctrinal confession. It means that basically what this book says, the faith, the faith once for all, brethren, that's laid down by God. Jesus Christ came to lay it down. We confess Confessing, professing, it has the idea of speaking. We are the ones who proclaim the truth of this book. And we do it with confidence. We do it with boldness. We do it unwaveringly. We do it with hope. It's in hope we cling to this. Now get the picture here. You take a bunch of... And and remember what's gone before this. 
Remember what's gone in verses 19, 20, 21? What, what is it? The blood of Christ, the great high priesthood of Christ. He's opened this way through the curtain, through His flesh. We have confidence in that. We have hope in that. And what the writer sees is you take all these individuals, bunches of individuals, and you take them full of hope in the cross, and you throw them all together in a meeting. And some sort of spiritual dynamic takes place. That's what he sees happening here. That's, that's exactly it. You, you take a bunch of these, you take a bunch of these unwavering, hope-filled, Jesus-loving, Jesus-worshipping, Jesus-trusting Christians, you throw them all in a meeting together, and you know what this author believes? He believes that there is a chemical reaction of spiritual proportion that takes place. All this Christ-giving hope just bursts forth between us somehow in a way that springs up and overflows with love and good. That's exactly what you see going on here. Exactly. A frenzy of love and good works being stirred, being provoked, being stimulated, being encouraged in one another through all of this. The author of Hebrews believes when you take individuals who are brimming over with this kind of confidence in what Christ is for sinners... You take these hope-filled folks, you bring them together into the same place. If there's a willingness and a submission on our part to submit ourselves to this Word here, then you get a spiritual dynamic put in motion whereby love is it's kindled. It's like a fire. Now listen. You listen. Jesus Christ said this. I want to show you a wise man and I want to show you a foolish man. The wise man, he built his house on a rock. The foolish man, he built his house on the sand. You know what? Matt was talking about the door this morning. Christ is the door. But here's the thing. Lots of people think they've gone through the door. You remember Matt spoke last week on the fact that there's, there's a guy that shows up in the in the, at the wedding, and he doesn't have the right clothes on. He doesn't have a wedding garment. There's a lot of people that think they're in the wedding, and they're part and parcel. They think they've gone through the door, but they're foolish. They're foolish. Because I'll tell you this, when you go through the door, you know what Jesus is saying by, come to me, I'm the door, pass through me? I mean, he's, he's basically, he stands there not only as a door, he stands there as the Lord. And he says this, listen, brethren, to be saved, the truest sense of being saved is to be conformed to Christ, to be conformed to His will. When you come to Christ to be saved, what you're saying is, Lord, I I know you're in control. I know you know what is good. I know you know what I need and what I don't need, and I'm surrendering to you. That's what it is to be saved. It's to have Christ take control of your life. And Jesus says this, you're a wise man if you come to me with the idea that you're surrendered to me. You're a wise man if you hear what I say and you do it. You see, you're a wise man if you think that coming to me and being saved has to do with surrendering to me, you're a wise man. You're a foolish man if you think you've come through this door, you think you're in the wedding feast, and you're not surrendering to me. You're basically living the life any way you want to. You're doing what you want to. Not, not whether you came to church. But how you're living your life, are you surrendered to Him? Listen, right here, He's saying to us, this is God-inspired language. This is the Lord Jesus Christ in all His authority laying down to His people, if you are My people, don't call Me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say. And here's one of the things that I sent the writer of Hebrews to you under inspiration from me to tell you. And here's what I want you to know. If you're My people, I expect... You're going to meet together. 
And, and see, if you just blow that off and you say, well, that doesn't really matter, that doesn't, that's not really part of this, I don't really have to take that serious, this, is just a, this isn't just a suggestion. Anytime, when we go to handle the Word of God, this is serious stuff. And this is what, this is what you have a picture of. And I, I want to break this apart. Let's look at the different pieces. I mean, what, what is this? Brethren, I'll tell you one thing this is. One thing that verses 23, 24, and 25 tell us is that you should never have any idea about the church in which and whereby you expect one man, you expect the pastor to basically come and serve up on a plate all that you need. That's, that's one thing you do not get from this verse, these verses. And what you see here is the reality that when you come together, when you meet together, you have a responsibility to each other. This does not say, let the pastor consider how to stir you up. That's not what it says. It says you, one another, have a responsibility here. But I want to break this down. I want to, I want to look at this. First, the, the main, or the, the starting point here that I'd like you to look at is in verse 24. I want you to consider the, the verb. I want you to consider the verb consider. That is the verb. The ESV reads this way. If you have it, you can see it. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. The NAS, New American Standard, reads very similarly. But let me tell you something. If you have the New King James or the Old King James Bible, it actually puts the word order in the same order that the original Greek text is in. You say, what does that matter? Well, because it reads a little different. It reads like this. Instead of saying, consider how to stir up one another, it says, consider one another how to stir up. You say, does that really matter? Well, I think it does. Obviously, the translators of the ESV and the NAS didn't think it mattered that much. But just, and maybe it doesn't matter that much. But just listen, just think. The direct object here, the direct object is the object that is the recipient of the action of the verb. The verb is to consider. What are we to consider? If, if you basically say, okay, it's telling me to consider how to stir up. Well, then the starting point might be the science of stirring up. But when you consider the direct object is actually one another, what this is telling you is you have a responsibility to study each other how to stir up. Rather than the general and generic study of how to stir up, the starting point is considering one another. And that's important because it becomes a lot more personal. It becomes a lot more intimate. You see, rather than just saying, well, how do you stir up people? And then coming here and saying, okay, I think it's this way. The starting point might be, hey, I consider, I consider this brother right here. I consider, there's Brandon Pitts. I'm going to consider him. I'm going to study him. What's true of him? What's true of his strengths? What's true of his weaknesses? What's true of his character? What's true of his spiritual gifts? What's true, I mean, where are his temptations? And as I'm looking at him now, and I have some idea about who he is, now, in light of that, I want to figure out how to help him. Because the truth is, we're all different, right? And if you start with considering one another, then you dive in first to consider, well, what gender are they? How long have they been saved? Where's their spiritual maturity at? Where's, where, you know, where, where are they prone to fall? Where are they prone to trip? I, I, I think, brethren, if we start at this place, it's helpful. Consider one another how to stir them up that that way it's not you're just not thinking about how to stir up all christians generally you're giving specific attention if you're part of this church you're thinking about individuals and it's very helpful if you also will consider thinking about well just let me say this you know it's easy to get involved in a clique in a church 
And if you're just thinking how to stir up one another, then you're, you're coming in and you're thinking how to stir up, how to stir up, how to stir up. Here's my click of five and how to stir up. But if you really focus in on the one another, which is what the author in the original was doing, then you're recognizing, you know what? I don't just have a responsibility to the one another among a, us five. I have a responsibility to one another of those that meet together. And so I'm looking over the shoulders of my clique and I'm recognizing I have a responsibility that goes beyond this. Very helpful there. Very helpful to have a church that is engaging one another in a broader basis. And I think a text like this helps us to realize this is exactly what God wants us to do. For the sake of the fruitfulness of the church, consider one another. And, And I also want you to consider this. This verb, consider, is, it's, not just a, a flip, it's not just like a casual glance kind of word. Be patient. Be patient. But it's, uh, it, this is a really intense word. This, this idea here, it, it literally has the idea of throwing your whole weight into considering this thing. This is an intensive study. This means that when you come to church, when you come into the gathered meeting, you have a responsibility to intently involve yourself in this. By the way, the only other place that the author of Hebrews uses this is back there where it says, consider Jesus. I mean, with the intensity that you study Jesus, or at least the same verb, Obviously, Jesus is to be the focus, and I don't want to put anything on an equal plane with that. But it is significant, I think, that he uses the same intense word for consideration to consider one another as he does for considering Jesus. It's that important. It's that significant to him. It's that emphatic to him. It needs to be that intense in our mind to think about that. Lots of intensity. An exor- this is an exhortation to take careful, intensified notice of each one's spiritual welfare. To focus the mind attentively, fix it on, contemplate with continued consideration the character of one another, the circumstances of one another, the imperfections of one another. Not to focus on the perfections. Remember, love covers a multitude of sins. We're not, we're not looking at all the imperfections of one another so that we can find fault, judge, and go, go you know, backbite and slander and gossip. But we know one another's weaknesses. And as you get to know, it can be right at these places where you can help encourage that person so that they can be more fruitful. I mean, if we use the knowledge we have of other people's imperfections, not to tear them down, beat them up, and think ourselves so superior, but we actually look at them and we take that in calculated form to figure out, okay, how can I best encourage this person to do good and to run faster and to love more? It's that kind of thing. I mean, we don't all have the same spiritual gifts. Obviously, the way and the capacity God has given each one of us to love and to do good works is varied as our spiritual gifts are varied. Certainly the way I would stir up one person to show love to other people who maybe has a gift of preaching is going to be different than another one who might have a gift of mercy. I mean, But that takes consideration. That takes study of one another. And the other thing, I, I, I mean, I think this just lends to, to us grasping. If, you, if you're seeing this picture in your mind of the way all this works, it's not examining other people in any way. I mean, obviously, if we find sin in other people that needs to be dealt with, well, we need to. But, but this, is, this is something that's guided by love. This is, this is a compassionate, a tender consideration and concern for one another. Affectionately taking into account where my brother might be weak, what discourages him, specific temptations, and doing this in a way that's meant to build up, to be profitable. And you know, the truth is, you you all know that the problems that we face, 
I mean, think about it. We live, we live in a world that's selfish. I mean, self is king, right? We got a place for Isla? Where are you going to put her? Right there. Let's, uh, let's get Isla in before... Somebody want to help? It looks like her dad has his hands full. There's some oxygen out there. Are you going to actually put her there or over there? Hello, Isla. Where do you want to sit? Back there or up here? What's that? Okay, let's put her up here. Got space for Dad right here. Do you need your oxygen? Okay. Okay, think about this, considering one another, I mean really think about it, we don't have any problem considering ourselves, we don't have any problem considering our problems, we don't have any problem considering our financial situation, we don't have any problem considering what pleases us, what's pleasurable to us, what makes us comfortable, what makes us happy, we don't have any problem with that. This, th- what this is, is the Lord is calling us to a self-killing mode here. To consider one another. I mean, you're, you're considering this. If, you're, if, if your primary concern isn't just how to stir up people generically, but you're actually considering one another. You're giving thought to person by person. Look, if, if you really come away from this, these verses with what, with the true intent. You should finish your days in this church having given time to every single person that comes and meets here. I mean that meets on a regular basis. I realize visitors come in, you don't even get to meet them, you don't know who they are. But people that attend here on a regular basis, you should be making it a habit to be thinking. And, and I'll tell you, Sometimes that's hard as a church grows especially. I mean, I have a list. I have a list of all the people that are members of this church and some that attend that are indicating they want to become members or at least are attending for a fairly long time. And I put their names down and I do it so that I can go through that list on a regular basis. Oftentimes during the week, I will go through that list. Sometimes sometimes various times in the week, several times a day sometimes. And I will just go through and I will contemplate, I will give consideration to the different people so that I know I can think about them. I can think about who they are. I can think about all these different things. I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're truly going to if you're truly going to bow to Christ in this and be this, this wise man who builds his house on the rock and you're going to take what Christ has to say in His Word to us and you're going to really put it into your life and put it into working shape and form. You're, you're actually going to imbibe this into, into the way you walk and live. You've got to be thinking. You've got to be considering. and you've, It's just like everything in life. You've got to plan. You've got to strategize. You've got to make this happen. It doesn't happen by accident. I mean, it's not difficult for you to think about your wife or your child on a regular basis or those who are in the inner clique or whatever, but really exercising the mind to give attention. It's a, it, we live in a world where people are selfish, they are self-absorbed, self-pleasing, self-glorifying, self-worshipping, self-gratifying. We know it. And our Lord steps into this world and He says radical things like, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Ooh, deny ourselves. That, this takes self-denial. There's no question about it. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, you know, hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and even his own life. You've got to be a life hater. Your own life hater. 
You've got to deny yourself if you would be His disciple. That's what He calls us to. Brethren, the the Apostle says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And Christian, if you're honest, if you're just totally honest, how much is your mind absorbed with the others? How much are you doing this? How much are you considering one another? You may consider what you want to do. You may consider what you want to watch. You may consider what you want to eat. You may consider what time you want to get up or what you want to do tonight or what you want to do with it. But how much money are you really giving? How much time are you really giving to considering one another for the sake of encouraging, stimulating love and good works in others? Which, by the way, I mean, you know, what the, you know what the book of Revelation says? It says when this is all said and done, when it's all over, you remember, the day. When the day comes, our works are tried. And in the book of Revelation, it says their works follow them. You know what that means? That means through all these coming ages, whatever you do in this life is going to follow you. And so you know what it means when I think and I contemplate and I consider and I study others in order to help them become more fruitful more loving, more good work doing, is I'm helping to increase their reward. That, that I am helping to give them that which they will never lose for all eternity. I mean, you talk about an expression of love. This is it, brethren. When you really are going to seek to be an instrument involved in somebody else's life, what, what a massive, selfless act it is. It's a selfish killing um, call here that we're given with emphatic intensity. You need to be throwing your whole weight of mind strength into this endeavor of thinking about others. How specifically and specially you can be there to help others, encourage them. I mean, you know, this really is a, it's a phenomenal, it's a tremendous measure of maturity. And as much as you are self-absorbed is such a measure of immaturity. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. In other words, I mean, when you're there to serve somebody, you're thinking about them. He came to give Himself. Not just His body, not just His blood. He gave His heart, soul, and mind to thinking about the welfare of His flock. This is a picture of the healthy church. The church that just has this idea, well, all that is what the pastor is supposed to do. That is unhealthy. That is not a good picture. A church like this pulsates with health. And you think about this. I mean, you think about the chief things. Doesn't it say, let your light so shine in the midst of this world that they might see your good works and what's going to happen? What's going to be the result? They'll glorify God. If there's any reason we're alive on the face of this earth, it is to glorify God. It is to be living for His glory. Do you realize what happens when you figure out how to stir up one another to good works? You're doing that which is going to bring God glory. You think about the, the preeminence of good works. Why? What? I mean, Jesus Christ died. He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify Him for Himself, a people for His own possession who are zealous of good works. You want to know why Christ died? He laid down His life to make a people of good works. You know what glorifies God? Good works. You know, above all. How many times do we read that in Scripture? Above all, love. Above all. Colossians 3.14, above all these, put on love. 1 Peter 4.8, above all, keep loving one another. I mean, when you help people to do good works and to love, you're helping them to be what glorifies God. You're helping them to be what Christ died to make them into. When you help them in love and good works, you are helping them to become what is above all important to God. This is no small thing. Can you see how this just pulsates with life? And reality, I've been, I've been a member of two churches where I've heard it repeatedly said. It's like a family here. You know what? That is good. When that can't be said of a church, you know what it means? It means the kind of involvement and intimacy. And it, it means that people aren't just involved in one another's lives on Sunday morning. They just don't come down and listen to the preaching. And I t- I, you've got to see this, this, this is the picture of health. 
This is the picture of life. This is it. You have a church that's doing all these things. You have. I mean, a lot of people, they, they talk about, you know, what, what is a healthy church? What does it look like? I'll tell you, it looks like this. Undi- there may be other things that are true about it, but this is it. And, and I want you to think about this. Are good works important? You better believe it. Love important? You better believe it. Above all? This abides? Well, here's the thing. God has His people. You might think God would say something like this. Hey, my son died to make these people zealous of good works. That's why he died. This is pretty important to me. They're going to do good works to glorify me. I'm interested in my glory. You know what? I'm cut past all the fluff. I'm going to directly go in there. I'm going to fill them with love. I'm going to fill them with good works. They're my workmanship. I'm going to do it. You all stand aside. But he doesn't do that. It's interesting how he has designed it. God has very specifically designed that I will grow more or less based on your willingness to consider me and stir me up. You see, that's how he did it. That means it matters. It matters if you do it. The ebb and flow of good works, the ebb and flow of love, God designed it to be directly attached and related to your willingness to do what's being said right here in Hebrews 10, 23, 24, 25. That's big. That's big. It means it matters. If it, You can't just say, well, God is sovereign, and whether I do this or don't do this, it doesn't matter because God's sovereign and He's just going to make it happen anyways. That is not what this is teaching. This teaches that the health of this church, God has made it hinge on, to pivot on, to be directly related to our involvement in one another's lives in this way. This isn't the only place this kind of truth is found in Scripture. Ephesians 4 is packed full of this interdependence on growth. Various other places we could look at. But God has designed for the Christian not... God has not designed for the Christian to be out there by himself, lone ranger, and to become everything that God intends for him to become. God designed us to grow, to live to serve in the context of community. He has. You you can't miss that here. This this, this is how God does it. This is the way He designs it. You all see what I'm saying? The rise and fall, the ebb and the flow of love, power, and holy living in this church directly tied to this. So, okay. I mean, let's, let's take it a little further. What does this look like? I mean, how do we do this? Well, for one, look at verse 25. Hebrews 10.25 Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Now, don't miss the simplicity of this. If you don't come to the meetings of the church, you will not enter into the social dynamic that is being presented here. Social dynamic. Social has to do with the way we interact. Dynamic is something that's in motion. You have movement. How does the church grow? How does the church function? How does the church interrelate? There's a dynamic. There is a spiritual dynamic, a social dynamic that is is being set in motion here. And if you're not here, it doesn't happen. There are people... Listen, this is the habit of some. Some have made it a habit. Why? Well, it's based on lousy thinking. There are some people that just believe, well, if I'm, if I'm at the meetings, or if I'm not at the meetings, it doesn't really matter. This doesn't say that. This says it does matter. This says don't forsake. Don't get into that habit. 
Whatever your thinking may be, if your thinking leads you to believe that whether you're there or not there, that's bad thinking. That's ungodly thinking. That is not consistent with these verses. It is wrong. It is backward. It is disobedient. I mean, God is telling you not to do it. And if you're doing it, you're disobedient, plain and simple. And this whole dynamic breaks down. If people don't come, if you don't come, you are not able with consideration of one another to stir them up to love and good works. If you're not here, you can't do it. That's, that's pretty simple. Verses 24-25 demand, and this is important too, they demand that we meet together. Notice it doesn't just say, come to church. It demands that you meet together in a way that you are able to consider and study one another. You meet together in a way that you are able to stir up one another. You meet together in a way that you are able to encourage one another. If you simply come here, listen to the preaching, and you get out that door as fast as you can afterwards, you are not doing what this says to do. No way, no how. You may chalk it up, a little notch on your belt. Well, I made it to church, and certainly God will take that into account. Listen, the reason that you come is so that you might be equipped for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is in love. You are to be building up one another. We meet together not primarily to preach the gospel to see the lost saved. You understand that. We meet together primarily to equip the saints, encourage the saints, build up the saints, so that as we break loose, the rest of our life is ministry to one another and to the world. That is the primary New Testament picture of what the church is all about. It's not simply an evangelist standing up to preach to a bunch of lost people. and hope, Now we do hope God will save in the midst of meetings, but primarily that is not the intent. So don't just come to church. Don't just make an appearance now and then. The habit of some. Isn't that interesting? Even 2,000 years ago, it was the habit of some to when service started, they weren't there. When certain meetings were held, they weren't there. It was the habit of some. And God is, God is saying don't do it. I'll tell you this. After And I've made this comment about some other things just recently. But you watch. The people that 10 years down the road you see are excelling. Mark my words. You note people that are excelling and then note their attendance record. They go together. And it's, I'm not talking legalistically they go together. I'm talking about when you come, you enter into this social dynamic and it really does make a difference on how much you mature, how much you grow, how much love there is in your life, and how many good works you do. I'm not talking about just the fact that you, you got the ability to chew on some deep theological concepts. I'll tell you this, God doesn't give two bits for your deep theological stuff if you don't have love. You're nothing but a clanging gong with all that if you don't have love. And, and listen, if you think so little of the brethren that meeting together just doesn't really matter, if you think so little of others that whether you're there or not just doesn't matter, I mean, you see what it's saying? I have the, I have the capacity to so fully help other people based on what this says here. I have this ability. And if I just chalk, if I just say, you know what, whether I'm there or not, just doesn't matter. I don't care. Can you see how that's just a pinnacle of selfishness? I mean, when God wants you to be there for the sake of helping others, and you just say, whether I'm there or not, I mean, typically people that are thinking that way aren't thinking about others at all. They're just thinking about what they want, what's comfortable for them, what's easy for them, what's nice for them. They're not really thinking about others. They're thinking about how, what they can get from others. I mean, un, undoubtedly, God has made us social people, so we do like to be around others. But you have to remember, there's something larger than just the typical social dynamic going on here. There's something the Spirit of God is involved in causing this, 
to come to pass. And listen, it says this, all the more as you see the day approaching. Well, I don't need to get into all the details of this, but if you go over and study Matthew 24, you know what? That's a good picture of the day approaching. What are we going to see? Wars, rumors of wars. But you know something else we're going to see? The love of many growing cold. Isn't that interesting? As the day approaches, as the time of Christ's coming approaches, the love of many is going to grow cold. Now, here's what it's saying. Christians, if you will give your, as you see the day approaching, well, how do you see it? Can you look on your calendar and it's all marked in red and you see it coming? No. The way you see it coming is by seeing the signs coming that go with it. Right? Wars and rumors of wars. Lots of wars. Lots of war, rumors of wars. Lots of people falling away. Those are the kind of things it says. We've had some people fall away here. The love of many will grow cold. You see the love of lots of religious people growing cold. I mean, I, I remember um, one of Benny Hinn's bodyguards was being interviewed and he said, Benny was working this old lady over and he got the last five dollars out of her and he ran in among all those counting money and he said, I got her last five. That's cold. That's just cold. And you know what? There's lots of people out there that are doing religion for the money. It's just cold. They're heartless. They, want to ste- they, they just want to fleece the flock. And what this is saying is this. It doesn't say the love of all will grow cold. In fact, what this is saying is all the more as you see that day approaching, all the more, all the more frequently, all the more with urgent, all the more giving specific attention to this, all the more if you do this, you will prevent this church from going the way of all that. Right? As all that is continuously going more and more cold, and as the love of many is growing cold, All the more as you see that happening, we need to be giving ourselves to this. It's protective, brethren. It protects us from going cold as we're getting more and more and more involved in people's lives. The more the persecution out there intensifies, the more the love of people grow cold, the more this world gets harsh and ungodly and uncaring and unloving and unconsiderate, the more we should be coming together and seeking to encourage one another and stir up Christ-likeness in one another. All the more. That's what it says here. All the more. And we're only moving towards it. The calendar doesn't go backwards. We're moving towards that day, day by day. And and basically, this is a picture that things are going to go from bad to worse. Post-millennial views just don't stack up here. Things are getting worse. They're falling to pieces. That day is approaching. Give ourselves. Well, okay. This is is my last point here. How? I, I mean, what... What, what is this? I mean, we can talk about this. We have a responsibility. But okay, when I'm face to face with somebody, what should, you know, on a real practical level, what happens? Well, I think the author of Hebrews gives us a tremendous example of this very thing. Look over at verse 32. Now, notice what's happening. Recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, You endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. Now that's a kind of introduction. He describes their being mistreated. But watch this. You had compassion on those in prison. Now stop stop right there. If I came and encouraged you to go show compassion to Christians in prison, you think that's consistent with stirring up people to love and good works? You better believe it. And by the way, if you just happen to jump right over to, you know, like Hebrews, what, verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 3, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. This is certainly something he wants us to do. He wants us to think about Christians in hard places. And He wants us to act like we're there with them. He wants our heart to so be trained on them and thinking about them and helping them and loving them and pouring ourselves out for them. And that's, But watch watch what happens. You had compassion on those in prison. I'm back in chapter 10, verse 34. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Now here's the thing. 
I know that when I'm coming into the midst of a church and I'm supposed to be studying all of you and I'm supposed to be helping you, stirring you up to love and good works, here's the thing I know. Whatever love I seek to stir you up to is going to cost you something. Because love always costs something. God so loved, cost Him His Son. He gave His Son. Love. They wanted to go love these people. It costs. It costs you time. It costs you money. It costs you effort. Sometimes it costs you the plundering of your stuff. Sometimes it costs you your life. I mean, some of you may remember Perpetua. Her pastor came and got himself thrown into prison so that he might encourage and strengthen those Christians that were going to be martyred there with Perpetua and Felicity and the others. It's cost. Now, it may cost you your life. It may cost you much less. But I know this. As I'm seeking to stir up people, there's a cost involved. And, that's, and, and you can see the cost here. You had your plundering of your property. But now watch this. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Now if you go back to verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. You go back to verse 19, confidence to enter the holy places the same thing that he's saying to these people is what he's saying right as he comes in to verses 24 and 25 he's saying he who promised is faithful you remember the promises of god i'll tell you what's what's he seeking to do in verse 23 he's seeking he wants them full of hope you see the word hope there 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 is a hope in this confession there is A holding fast to the confession of our hope. There is a God who gives promises. There is a future expectation. Remember this. Paul says to the Galatians, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but faith that works through love. Now you think about what that looks like. Faith. My looking to Christ, it works through love as I trust Christ, as I abide in Christ, as I feed on Christ, as I trust Him, I walk with Him, all of that demonstrates itself through love. Well, rather than faith, working through love, this is hope, working through love. And all hope is, is future faith, right? Hope is what I don't have. Hope is an expectation of tomorrow. In this God who is promised, who's faithful. There's all these promises. Do you realize that when people have hope, they're free to love. They're free to do good. Hopeless people don't love. They make wretched lovers. Why? Because if you go, if you go talk to somebody and, and all they can think in, in all their misery is that they're probably going to go to hell and they're uncertain about their foundation and they have little or no confidence and they're all shaken all over, they're so consumed and worried about themselves and their own situation, they're certainly not free to love. And, and typically, any love or at least surface expressions, remember the Pharisees tithed. But what, is all those, what does all those works look like when a person has no security and no hope? All it looks like is works that they're doing as a slave to try to earn God's favor. And that isn't freedom. That isn't hope. That's slavery. That isn't true love. That's somebody trying to earn something out there. Do you realize when you have a hope of all these things, what things? The promises. He's talking about reward. He says, you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. I mean, if I'm coming along and I realize my house isn't forever, I've got, I've got a room with the Lord. I come along and I look, my money isn't forever. And he says, I can store up treasure in heaven. I come along and I re- recognize I have a reward at the end of this thing. I mean, I get so full of hope that in just a few more years I'm going to be with the Lord and everything I've done here follows me I mean you see when we come together 
You've got all these forces in this world that are seeking to unseat our hope, take away our faith. Faith attacking things. I mean, you've got all these commercials. Put your hope in insurance. Put your hope in the securities of this world. Put your hope in retirement. Put your hope in what the world hopes in. Big bank accounts. Put your hope in the political system. In what president we have. It's like the world's hopes are just built on these things. But if we come along and we recognize we have a reward. The blood of Christ has purchased for us an eternity full of of the fulfillment of all of these promises. The treasures are ours. Everything throughout this eternal life. We have, we have Christ. We have glory. We have a glory that is absolutely going to consume us. We have an eternal weight of glory. We have the kindness of God going to be directed to us forever and forever. We're going to be a people whom He's just going to seek to show the vast extents of His mercy by all the things that He does for us through these coming ages. You see, if you've got all this hope, and as we come together to meet together, and now I'm considering you, the one and others of the church, and I recognize you're coming in here with a world that's just pounding you to trust what this world trusts. Trust what the bank account ledger says. Trust the checkbook. Trust silver and gold. Trust who the president is. Trusting all these things. You, you don't have health insurance! What are you, some kind of crazy person? Don't you know if you get sick, you're going to be in all this trouble? And see, if you're just spending your whole life consumed and concerned with all these things that the world's consumed and concerned with, but if you come in here and we can convince one another, look, you're in the hand of God. All your sins are forgiven. You're, you're the free man. You can go out and you can love and you can do good and it's going to follow you forever. And it's real. Reward is real. Your works are going to be put out there one day. And it, you know what? For the Christian, it's all going to be reward. It's going to be looked at and it's going to be commended. Because everything that wasn't good is under the blood. It's burned off. It's not there. Well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, look, that's guaranteed. It's like somebody has said, you know, we're guaranteed an A ahead of time. We're guaranteed success at the beginning of this thing. I mean, all our sin is paid. We're freed. All our sin is paid and all is glory and all is reward and hope. I mean, we have promises. What in the world have we been promised? We've been promised that the day is coming when the tears are going to be wiped away. We've been promised that all these good things that we do in this world are going to follow us. We've been promised that if we take our money and lay it up in heaven, there is treasure there. I mean, as you go through into the, into the very end of Hebrews, he says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. He says, remember those who are in prison, who are mistreated. He says this, he says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You know what? You can give it all away. You can give it. You can give your time. And we need to be encouraging one another that way. We need to be keep coming alongside and saying, brother, don't hold on to it. Brother, take, reach out to people. Seriously, give consideration to adoption. Seriously, give consideration to giving more. Seriously, consider giving your house, your possessions up to things that actually have eternal value and are going to mean something when you come to stand before God. Don't live like the world. Don't trust the things that the world trusts. And so that's it. I mean, I, I hope you can see this picture in your mind. But you've got to meet together. You've got to come together. You've got to meet together. And you've got to consider one another. And you've actually got to make it a point. Not just, how are you doing? But you need to make it a point to pour yourselves out, to give yourselves. This is, this is healthy church life. Alrighty, brethren. Amen.